Stanford, Trevor Mark from University of Michigan, Win Mehu from Illinois, Philemma from IBM Research, Maurice Hui from Wisconsin. The format of the panel is the panelists will give a two minute opening statement, and I hope that is kept to two minutes. And then we'll open the forum for them to agree, disagree, agree as well as disagree, and then if we have time, we can take some questions from the audience. Okay, well, I also don't believe in uh, multiple choice questions, so uh, let me unplug Trevor's slides so it doesn't distract you um, while I talk. Um, so I think, I think that the, uh, the multiple choice was wrong. I mean, the, the purpose of industry research, quite simply, is to have a maximum impact, positive impact on the world, um, usually by developing things that couldn't have been developed anywhere else. I think that, that there are two things that characterize good industry research. One is taking really big leaps, trying something that hasn't been done before, trying a completely different approach. A computer architecture means, you know, throwing everything out. You know, nothing is sacred. ISA isn't sacred. What a computer looks like isn't sacred. And seeing, you know, given the constraints of technology, whether you can actually um, make a large difference in what things are going to do. Tuning isn't for university research. I mean, small, small changes on the existing status quo are done much better in industry where there's lots of resources to throw at it. The advantage that universities have is that they can fail. Um, and, and they should really take advantage of that. That's what really sort of separates um, university research from industrial research, which typically is much more constrained and has to deliver something ultimately um, that works. The other thing that university research has to do is carry it far enough. And I think people need to realize that the goal is not to write a paper. Writing a paper might be an interesting side effect along the way, but the goal is to have an impact. And very often, writing a paper doesn't provide compelling evidence to the people who would pick it up and have it be impactful, um, that it actually works so that the risk is low enough for them to do it. Usually you have to build a prototype to do that. And most university researchers stop short of that point because it's hard and the point counting is done in terms of papers, not, not in terms of impact. Um, I think training and educating students is a great side effect of university research, but it's not the main purpose. The main purpose is, is to make these big leaps. And I actually, kind of lament that I think there's less of that going on because I think a lot of what has made um, the computer industry in the United States great ultimately came out of, of university research in the early days, but things have become much more conservative and much more incremental um, since then. Um, and and on, on the um, sort of you know, multiple choice section, I'll, I will comment that it's specifically not about preparing for a startup. I think if somebody wants to go do a startup, they should resign their university position and go do that. Um, I think it's a huge conflict of interest if you exploit graduate student labor um, to do work that ultimately is going to be profit making for you individually um, in, in a startup. I founded four companies. Three of them did come out of, out of university research, but it was an after the fact thing. It was not what we were aiming at at the time that we were, we were, we were developing the work. Um, so you know, the, the big message is the goal of university research is to have a big impact. You don't do that by making small incremental changes to the status quo, you do that by changing what the status quo is to something completely different, and, and that's the goal.
better? Yeah. So the, the list is in A, B, C, D, down to F in black. This is Yale's list, and I said I didn't have any real uh, strong disagreement with that, so I ticked all of the above. So I'm not sure why I'm on the panel, but I'll try and be di um, sort of contrary. So, so um, I, yeah, I sort of, and I'll end up disagreeing with Bill on some of these points later, I do think it's important to educate students. So that was my addition there, not train them. We had a, a famous event at the University of Michigan where one of our deans in the liberal arts school said that the purpose of the engineering college was to train people, whereas their purpose was to educate people. So that went down like a lead brick. Um, <laughs> I don't know what they're educating them. Critical thinking, they always talk about critical thinking. I've never figured out what they're talking about because they, they can't do anything. Okay, um, I'm not going to use new slides. I'm going to just reuse these uh, slides. A couple points. One is um, I'm going to go down the list and uh, put in some qualifications. As uh, any good professors would do, uh, we always going to say but, right? And the second one is uh, I'm uh, very glad that I'm an early career faculty. So a lot of the questions help me to think about what I'm going to do for the real part of my career in the next 35 years. <laughs> um, so. Uh, to advance knowledge, the answer is yes. Um, we definitely would like to um, to start uh, advanced knowledge, but uh, I think we need to be realistic about what advancing knowledge means. Many of us equate advancing knowledge uh, with publishing papers. The more papers we publish, the more advanced knowledge. And after uh, being in academia for a few years, um, I don't think that I can equate that anymore. And so. I serve, when I serve on the promotions committee for uh, our campus, I noticed that uh, for some of the disciplines who have been around for many, many years, such as English, such as uh, you know, literature kind of uh, field, their tenure uh, promotion pro uh, criteria is one book, a well-researched, well-published book that really supposed to advance a particular point of the knowledge. And I'm not sure the way that we currently run our conferences and so on really advance the knowledge in a, uh, in a real way. So the answer is yes, but uh, let's be realistic about what we really do to advance knowledge. And um, the second one is to serve industry. Uh, I think as an engineer, you know, what, uh, fundamentally we do want to serve or lead or help industry because that's part of the engineering career. However, uh, one thing that uh, I do want to caution, you know, what, uh, including myself, um, we probably cannot uh, um, expect too much in return from industry these days. Whether it's funding or the, um, uh, whether it's uh, real engagement, because uh, from what I'm seeing is that um, we actually have very strong competition uh, with the new model of industry uh, research and development, and these companies are really, uh, many of these companies are doing the kind of things that uh, we used to consider university research. If you look at Google, if you look at uh, Facebook, um, their model is not to come out and uh, fund and uh, hit the sort of uh, the in return to, uh, to help the university in general. So it, it is something that we should be realistic about. And the third one is to, uh, to pre prepare for doing a startup. 
Um, you know what? I truly think that if you have an idea that you can connect it with a bigger scope economic problem, by all means, you know what, the, the do that startup. But I would say I would not confuse the level of funding or the level of uh, money we make out of startups with the technical achievement. I think that's the biggest confusion that we have these days. And the fourth one is to train students or educate students. That's the only one that I'm not going to have any qualification. I'm going to just say yes. That's the fundamental reason why we're at the university. That's the fundamental reason why we're uh, doing anything that uh, we do on a daily basis in a university. So there's, I just don't see any reason why we would uh, qualify that. Thank you. So I'm not sure why we're all getting up tonight, other than you have better cover here in case <laughs> things are thrown. But, <clears throat> and I think I will just sit down, since Phil said there's no use to, uh, uh, no need to come up there. I got my, I got my mic here, right? It works. So, uh, I think uh, uh, before I, you know, talk about this, I just want to put a little context. Uh, 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 there's what university should be, the university research should be about, and what it's sort of getting pushed to be about. And there's also a distinction between, you know, private and public universities. And what seems to be happening at most public universities is, hey, I'm a taxpayer, why aren't you solving my problem? Okay, and so everything you do should be about solving my problem. 
In my view, university research should be purely about advancing knowledge, okay, about looking into the far ahead and trying to advance knowledge. Uh, unfortunately, industry makes a claim, hey, I'm a taxpayer, you know, you should be serving industry. Um, preparing for startups, now that's the new, what university should be doing. Contributing to the university research should be contributing to the economic base. Okay, so you should be doing more startups, if you will. Uh, train students, that's sort of an interesting one, okay? Uh, again, a lot of taxpayers are saying, hey, we want you to train students so they can come work for us so we can make money. Uh, it's rarely about we want you to be educating the future that will then, that will you know, uh, educate people who will be creating future knowledge. I, don't, I have never heard anybody come say that should be what the uh, research university be do, should be doing. And later on, as we go into more of our discussions, I will disagree with Bill that the university should be building anything. And Irvin will support Bill. I hope some others hopefully will support me in that position. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I will leave it at that. It should be purely about doing knowledge that is very risky, that others aren't daring to do, and it could be very simple with one faculty member doing it with them by themselves. In fact, some of uh, the, uh, you know, the best work that uh, I'm well aware of uh, that has come out of my university has sort of been one faculty member just doing it by themselves. So. It's in computer science, not necessarily computer architecture. So we'll leave it at that. Well, Gur Guri got one thing wrong. So he keeps saying, I'm a taxpayer. I want free stuff. That's way in the past. Now it's, I'm not a taxpayer. I want free stuff. Well, one thing, I, one thing I've noticed going to a lot of universities now, which was, did not used to be the case, is they're all huge. I mean, it used to be all the cranes were in, uh, whatchamacallit, in the, the Mideast. The, the ver and now when you go to campuses, you see all the cranes on campuses. So, so universities are pulling in lots of money. And when I look at the cost of tuition at universities, that's the one thing that's been on a steady incline because a lot of other industries have fallen off to zero and they're not growing. But then I talk to professors and they say, well, the way they're administering universities is they're hiring, quote, teachers and it's, it's not that the faculty is growing, but the university is growing and taking a lot more money to run itself. I don't fully understand why that should be or whether that's the goal. Because it does everything. Universities today try and do everything. But, you know, we, we even have our own uh, uh, market, fresh fruit market thing on, on campus, if you can believe it. Well, like, like one thing I've heard people object to, which makes total sense to me, is usually the highest paid person at a, at a university is the football coach if it's a good team. Yeah, actually, at our place, it's a, a um, plastic surgeon whose name, unfortunately, is Grab. <laughs> <laughs> but the only other growth industry is, you're right, it, the universities are going, it's got to stop. It's yeah. just going out of control. Michigan, for instance, is the largest, or the second largest employer, apart from the state,
He knew something more fundamental. That's where something was wrong. Well, again, I think at the engineering level, BS level, it's they hand them something specific to do, and they say, go do this. At the research level, I want someone coming in with lots of breadth that when I first went to Watson, they said, oh, there's your office. I said, well, what do you want me to do? They said, I don't know, just do whatever you want to do. And that was puzzling to me, but that's, that's what I want to see, you know, top graduate students being told to do. Just when they come into, when they come into say, a university, I mean, I'm sorry, an industrial research center, I, I don't want them to be handed jobs to do. You can hand jobs to someone with a lot less expertise. Yeah, well, I'll second the notion for breadth. If I put my industry hat on, the one thing that I find completely frustrating is we'll get some new PhD, and they'll be working on some problem, and I'll talk to them, and I say, well, could there be a circuit solution to that problem? And they go, no, I don't do circuits. I'm a computer architect, or, you know, maybe you could solve that with a compiler. They go, oh, no, I don't do compilers. I'm a computer architect. And I think people have become very narrow, or maybe they just feel like they need a union card to work in those different um, levels. But I think, you know, like Yale Stack, people need to feel very comfortable going up and down the stack, because very often the solution is not at the level where they may have the greatest comfort zone. It's a good question, and uh, a lot of companies suck our students out just based on specific knowledge. Can you program in X? And then, you know, they give you a test. You go there, they'll, how do you build a linked list and traverse it or something? If you do that, okay, fine. But of course, six years down the road, that skill is not particularly interested. They don't seem to want, um, it, the demand isn't there, it seems to me, for a sort of rounded education. And that's sort of why I got rid of the teach students and put educate students, but. So now, one thing that, at least from my perspective, is that um, when, s when we build things in the university, so this is starting this fight with Gary here, um, Whenever we, we build something in the university, we tend to produce students who are um, more rounded, well-rounded. And uh, we will see students who will clearly see the value of you know, circuits versus compilers versus microarchitecture, because they need to get that thing to work. And if but those students may not produce a ISCA paper or micro paper in the third year of their, their grad school or the second year of their grad school, which we pressure them to do today. So I think we, you know, uh, we if we really want the kind of students that you're looking at, you know, well, we we need to know that there is a cost for educating that kind of student, and we really need to be okay or even enthusiastic, enthusiastic yeah. about. Well, I think I think we can reduce. Uh, so I, I have to confess, I don't know if there's any of them in the audience here that I I did sort of burn out a number of graduate students on our first few prototype machines, <laughs> and, and what I. Why they're not in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> And, and I think what, what I discovered in that process is that there's, it, there's roles different people play. And you want the students playing the roles of actually being the creators and the leaders. But then you want professional staff um, to be playing the roles of actually crunching the hardware out because they tend to actually get it right the first time. And also, it's not something that's really appropriate to burn up you know, many graduate student years on. That's not why they came to MIT or Stanford to, to do their graduate career. And so striking the right balance between having them be involved in building the prototype and not having them turning the crank at a very low level, I think, you know, hits the right bound. But it still takes some longer to graduate than somebody who simply takes some off-the-shelf simulator, throws some little idea in there, runs a few simulations on it, and writes a paper. Is this being recorded? <laughs> I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like the recording of this, please. <laughs> <laughs> now, if only Arvind could uh, uh, speak. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the point uh, uh, Bill is making is precisely now the right one, which is the knowledge that the students have to get. And by the way, while uh, uh, let me digress a little bit as to sort of industry, uh, many students come to me and ask me about, hey, I want to do an internship in uh, industry. Why do you want to do the internship? Because I'm going to learn all this other stuff about industry, and I said, if you want to make money in the summer, good. Go do that internship, okay? Because you will be doing, what you will be doing is 
debugging somebody's simulator and running somebody's simulations. <laughs> if somebody is telling you, oh, come, you learn all this stuff, that's all <laughs> marketing, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, okay. So you are going to be doing all that, and that's fine. There's nothing to take away from that because you'll be paid well, more than you can get paid over here, go do that. That's well good. But, uh, you know, it is very important to learn all that, you know, you know, building software and all these kind of things. I don't agree with Wenme, it's important to learn building software. But what I, what I have a problem with is finally turning the crank on the actual hardware, which I'm glad to hear Bill say it should be professional engineers turning that crank, not graduate students. Thank you. I think that uh, I am starting my year 41 at the university. I start very young teaching 21. So what I learned is that in order to be a good professor, you need to know what you are talking about. If you, if you uh, sometimes it is not true. The second thing is that if you did research in the topic, probably you know better. I found the best professor normally are the best researchers, at, at least uh, this is what I learn, but I think we need to educate to the student in two more topics. One of them is the culture of the effort. Life is not simple, it's not easy, but the most important for me is the ethical behavior. Okay, that should be as important part as the technical thing, okay? Ethical behavior, what do you think about that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, it's tough to disagree with what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, so I guess we can expand, right? So when we say train or educate, in what? Thinking, uh, technical knowledge, writing skills, technical knowledge, this whole spectrum. And there are some spectrums that you can emphasize more than the other. One, one thing I will take issue with what Matteo said is, going back to my days as a department chair at, at Stanford, the people who were the best researchers usually were negatively correlated with the people who were the best teachers. And it really has to do with how people budget their time. Um, and, and there were some people who were great on both sides, and those are just exceptional individuals. But there's some people who clearly put all of their heart and soul into their research, and they say, oh yeah, I was supposed to be teaching class five minutes ago, I better, guess to go, better go there and, and you know, start waving my hands and think of something with zero preparation. Um, and then you know, there, there are people who put all their heart and soul into their teaching and basically completely ne neglected their research. And the, by and large, they were really excellent teachers. I mean, they, they would teach you know, the you know, lower division courses usually, but they would do it in a very polished way. Well, Maureen, you know, you know how to tell if an engineering student is an extrovert, right? When, he, when he's staring at your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Should I go first? I'll go first. Mike, I think uh, you hit on precisely the issue that I think a lot of universities are having to wrestle with. It used to be the case that uh, uh, you know you could go to some federal government agency, and not ask for large sums of money, small sums of money to do pure research, you know, forward-looking research. Uh, that's becoming less and less true. And so it all, you know, all of even, you know, with the, with industry or something else, it was always about what the sponsor wanted done and everybody understood that. Uh, and so, you know, you cut out little time for that if that's what you, uh, you know, want, uh, felt like doing, if you want the additional money. 
Uh, but uh, even the, you know, the more advancing pure knowledge kind of, you know, funding for that, I think, is being cut down. And it's only if you have, you know, sort of like a, a, a lucky enough to have some discretionary funding in terms of an endowed chair or so on like that, that you can continue to do that. Yeah, Unfortunately, my, my I think a that is different. I mean, I've, I've always had the view that I sort of had thought of what research project I wanted to do. You know, let me put my academic hat on. And then I went out and I found somebody to fund it. And that, it was never the case when I couldn't find somebody to fund it. That said, it got monotonically more difficult you know, over, over my 26 years as a faculty member. When I started out as an assistant professor at MIT and nobody knew who I was, I went down to DARPA and I told them, I want to build this kind of crazy parallel machine. And you know, here's how we're going to program, and it's going to send you know messages around and and take work to the data and all this. And they they asked me how much money do you need, and I came up with a number. And Patrick Winston, who's the director of the iLab at MIT at the time, kicked me under the table because I should have asked for way more. <laughs> um, and 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 so you know, it was very easy at that point in time to sort of come up with whatever you wanted to do, go go to DARPA, and as long as it it actually had some promise, you would get lots of funding for it. And what I found is. Um, there was a very abrupt downstep in, in academic funding, at least from my perspective, when Tony Tether became director of DARPA and decided that he didn't like academics and he didn't like computer architecture. And I found, I found that I wound up having to go and, and get piddly little NSF grants, which would sort of fund one student each. So if you had a research group with 20 students, you spent an enormous amount of time writing grants and, and pandering to the sponsors. You could still raise money for pretty much any good idea you had, but it just, the overhead was much higher. <coughs> Hello, this is working? Oh, good. <laughs> so I had a, a, a few comments. Uh, first was just the raise in tuition fees. I mean, at MIT, the tuition, I think, has doubled since 1990, uh, but not the intake of money, because uh, the amount of aid that is given out to the undergraduates has increased even more rapidly, because MIT is a needs-blind institution, you know, so it doesn't look at your finances when it admits, so a lot of money is going towards undergraduates. So the number, the tuition money is really a funny kind of an indicator of the cost of education. The second point I wanted to make is that there is uh, another thing that public doesn't see, which is the overheads in the university. You know, you write a grant and the cost keeps going up and up and up, and we seem to have no control over it, even though we are professors and supposedly we run the institution uh, because they say oh no 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 this is negotiated with federal government and and you know nobody else can be charged less overhead than this etc i frankly don't understand it but it's astounding neither the students are getting paid much more money but the cost of a student has skyrocketed i mean it's now 70 uh, the overhead is really simple so um you know, when i started as an assistant professor at mit the ratio of faculty to non-academic staff, people who reported to the vice president of administration, exactly. have was roughly one to one. It is now almost seven yeah, to yeah. one. Yeah. And those people contribute nothing to the academic mission. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, I mean, we have to realize something that uh, this is a concrete fact, that the number of proposals that are submitted from MIT since 1990 has gone up tenfold. Submitted from MIT. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you know, submitted from MIT. And you have to understand, our faculty size has been fixed for the last 50 years. So there is no increase in uh, faculty size. There is no increase in undergraduate student population. So all the increases, either in graduate student population or in administrator, as Bill is talking about. So I don't know who to blame in all this. But, but <laughs> this... <laughs> Well, that's, that's one reason that is A lot of those administrators there. are there because there's a rule that's okay. made and then an administration pops up to comply. I in college, right? I guess, yeah. um, signature loan, any amount of money, they need to check whether you take, whether you go to the school. <laughs> yep. I can take out a loan. I can put the loan, for example, I'm, I have to give you a C right now. I right. can tell you the tuition. So the 40, 46 k a year, okay? <laughs> I can take out a loan for 70 k the, the university will get 46 and they'll hand me a check back in 30. Wow. <laughs> Problematic. No, yeah. yeah. So we can turn you in under the whistleblower act now, right? <laughs> 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 right. I, I think the. <laughs> I think, but on a more serious issue, to how does it affect my research? Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, I mean, I have to run a research group, and we already talked about the cost of you know students and postdocs, and so on. I had to raise the money. 
And I completely agree with Bill. I mean, that used to be so much easier, and it just gets harder and harder, you know. So if you are filing proposals to NSF, I just look at it as a pipeline. Just keep dumping proposals in, because it's like a lottery. You don't know what will get funded, and, and it'll, it's going to fund one or two students. But what I've personally done is I'm raising a lot more money from industry, which is not very large amounts, but, you know, it's, it's enough to... Uh, keep funding and as long as you keep getting money and it has some very positive side to it because you know then you're interacting with them a lot so it's a resilient model only if you are dealing with enough industries because some are always going down and some are always coming up and and you just have to keep at it you know a lot more effort involved but that's the reality today i would not uh mold my research too much to the needs of a company because I choose the company based on, you know, what I'm trying to do and, and then I will, because I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> exactly. And actually in education, I think there is probably consensus amongst a large number of faculty members. We should not pay too much uh, attention to what industry says, you know, about education on one hand, right? So we do not say, oh, this is what we should teach in computer architecture because that's what Intel wants. On the other hand, industry is a very important validator for us. I mean, if our students were not being employed uh, by the top people in industry, we'll be very unhappy. So maybe they'll employ them anyway because they're MIT students, but really we do not take the suggestions from industry very seriously about curriculum. You know, I, I think that's a pretty important I, I thing. I think what you're saying is that you should listen to them, but not necessarily take uh, right, right, everything right. they say. Uh, uh, probably, yes, things. yeah. Right. And, and one more uh, thing, which is a problem from my point of view, where we are contributing to the problem, is the reward system uh, in research is certainly death, death, death. You know, are you the champion of your silo or not, you know? Are you the best architect, or, or, or is uh, are you going to be as good as Bill Daly is, or was, you know, in his youth? <laughs> 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 right. So that's that's one side of it, right? But the other side of it is, uh, we also want breadth. So the way I always explain to uh, young faculty members is, you know, breadth is very very good, provided you're deep in something. Because if you're not deep in anything, you cannot survive in modern environment. And that part is getting tougher and tougher and tougher. But to be a good engineer, you have to be broad. Otherwise, you can't do engineering. And I think this is where there is a slight conflict. Because for students who are going to go into industry, the depth up to a point is important. But the breadth is a lot more important. A lot more important. But, but, but an interesting thing there, to, to become a big, big name, it's lots of publications, and in my opinion, the, the academic conference publications have become very formulaic. And if you put out a paper that says, oh, here's a completely new thing, it gets shot down, nobody, you know. So the, the papers that make it are, here's the same old thing with a little wrinkle, and it's put together in this format, and that's, then people can judge it. Of course. Know? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm not at all, uh, you know, I'm not going to defend that system at all. And I can tell you that we have slight advantage in that at MIT in the sense that we really do not pay attention to it. So but most, but most industries do, right? So a question for the panel. So there was a consistent theme today that, you know, the conference theme is broken, the conference theme is broken. Conferences are not dynamic entities. It's made by people like us. It's people like us who sit in the panel. What? Do different so that more useful, more valuable, more in the right direction that you guys Yeah, I think I think ultimately it was interesting. I went to, when I was department chair, I went to this workshop that NSF had about not just conferences being broken, but a whole big chunk of the field being broken. And, and at the root of the problem is a lot of people count papers. And and when I was on the promotion and tenure committee at Stanford, we had a very explicit goal never to look at number of papers. Exactly. And we would always ask the question, what is this person's, whether it was for tenure or for promotion to full, what is this person's one biggest contribution? And how does that compare to the top five people 
and, and we would, our letters always ask for comparisons to five peers, and we would try to judge the top five in the field at that career stage. And I think if everybody had that goal where they asked, what is the one best contribution, um, people would not be trying to write little results anymore, right? Because that isn't going to advance that. Um, they wouldn't be trying to stack up a publication count. They would be trying to do one really good thing, which is a much better objective. But, but unfortunately, then you don't make it through the review process. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, that's... No, I'm saying you change so the review process so that so it's about uh, the one best thing. Uh, actually, I think you're mixing up two things. I'm not, I'm not talking of how papers get accepted in conferences. Oh, okay. we, are, we are talking about how we look at the record, publication record of a faculty candidate when he's up for promotion. Uh, but, but I think it, that then feeds back into the conferences because now you have a lot of people who are trying to get quantity up. Mm -hmm. and, and the review committees have a limited number of slots, and they, the conversation starts mm -hmm. to be about what's wrong about a paper. And so you wind up accepting a lot of papers where there's very little wrong with them, but there may not be anything right with them either, yeah. as opposed to if you change yeah. the, the goal where people aren't going to be trying to get the quantity up, they're going to wait and maybe submit you know, wait, you know, one paper a year um, on their very best thing, and then you won't have the oversupply problem you have, and, and you know, more things with big holes in them will get accepted because there's good things about them, even though there's a lot bad about them, too. Yeah, I agree with uh, Bill. Uh, I think that collectively we probably have, uh, you know, hundreds of conference uh, program chair experience here, right? Um, it, it really comes down to how many papers you really need to, um, you know, uh, choose your papers from. And you know what? Most people say California freeways are terrible. The reason why they're terrible is not because they're bad freeway systems, it's because there are too many cars. And you know they're probably better freeway system than Illinois, but um, you know the experience is bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Moyne, uh, I think uh, over there, while the panel may agree that all these things are important, there are a lot of people who are on the conference program committees who believe B is the most important. And you know, so what you do in computer architecture has to be industry relevant. The problem is industry doesn't know what is industry relevant five years from now. And so what you end up doing always is because B is so important, always have incremental small things that can be highly polished. Yeah, but you, ha you have to ask, what, it, what does it mean to be relevant? I mean, if somebody publishes a paper which is a small incremental step, most people in industry are going to ignore that because they've either already done it or, or perhaps have moved beyond it because the, you know, the, the industrial research labs aren't st stationary and stuff that's advancing the status quo is, is generally ignored. People in industry look to the conferences and to, and to our relationships with various academics for things that we're not doing. Um, but, but we want them to carry it far enough that we can see it's relevant. It's really, people need to basically make big jumps and carry the ball far enough that industry can pick it up at the other side. Replicating what industry is doing by thinking that that's relevant is not a useful use for academic research. I think there's less fu real funding, actually, in, in, in sort of real terms, and that's why it's become difficult to fund research programs in academia with any sort of durability. In other words, it's difficult to tell your student that you'll be able to support him three years or her three years from now because you, you really don't know. So, and it's not a very good way to run education, actually. I, I'm not sure why we support graduate students here from research grants. That just creates a whole bunch of bureaucracy. Why not just give the guy a scholarship to go to graduate school? So you realize that that's what they, in, in the College of H&S uh, at, at Stanford, Humanities and, and Sciences, the English department funds all their graduate students that way. They have zero research contracts. 
and every graduate student is aligned directly from the provost. But I think that um, if we were to move to that model, we would lose something which is very valuable, which is I think competition hones ideas. And so having to compete for research grants is a positive thing. It's just there needs to be a bigger pot to compete for. Yeah. Uh, I, to some extent, that's good. But the problem with the student, from the student's point of view, if they sign up with a professor and then they realize that the guy's a jerk and they don't want to work with him anymore, <laughs> they've um, – not that it's happened to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, they're stuck. It's very difficult to change. <coughs> If they had their own, if they were funded directly, they could the, actually be the other way around. The, the faculty would say, please come and work with me. You know, you can have weekends off. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot wrong with the funding model. It's just this society that has less money in real terms than it did maybe 40 years ago. This is just another symptom of reduced resources. You know, you can go to other places in the world and you notice that they're just throwing money at these things. They've got students, faculty, out the wazoo. We don't have, it's not quite like that. Anymore. But that's not necessarily resulting in better research, is it? Mm -hmm. I mean, the model you're suggesting in other no, countries is not no, necessarily I resulting agree with in. You. Not necessarily, but yes. the, it helps. There's a very high correlation with the average wealth of a society in the and the sort of creativity and what you need. I'm a sure if you talk to Singha, they'd have a position for you. <laughs> <laughs> to, to Tom's question uh, about uh, you, you're exactly right that you probably have produced too many academics. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, Yale's sent too lots of people in faculty positions, and they're all writing papers. If you just not send them to faculty positions, you'd have been fine. That problem will self-correct. In a little while. I don't think it's a problem of PhD production because I've, I've graduated close to 60 PhDs in computer architecture now, and roughly a third of them have taken faculty positions. They're actually a little bit less than a third. And uh, I think it basically it's the s demand side of that, right? Because uh, there's plenty of positions in industry for the ones that don't take faculty jobs. So it's really the question of the demand for people doing computer architecture work in universities has gone up. The supply has always been there. Uh, And, and by the way, uh, like liberal arts was brought up that like if you're an English professor and you have a big difference is none of the graduate students in English think that anyone's going to pay them anything because <laughs> they, they know this stuff. They're in it because they love it. A lot of them come in smarter than yeah. me, so that's that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always think that the, the right way to cultivate a graduate student is just to kind of give them a lot of rope. So I, I tend to have a kind of hands-off approach to, to graduate students where I meet with them periodically and chat with about what they're doing. But that way they kind of have to discover on their own. And because I'm not giving them the answer and telling them what to do, they wind up figuring it out. And they usually figure it out better than I would have told them. I, I sort of agree with Bill on that. The problem there is you know, you've got to keep them around for a while when they're not being productive and the requirements of a lot of funding is you've got to do something tomorrow and so forth. So um, it's difficult to do that. You're always sort of shielding them from reality in a sense. We have to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's we have to do that. It isn't that you leave them alone. It's that if they get too far, then you pull them back. But you've already written your thesis. And 
and they will make false starts, and that's why it takes longer to graduate. That's why you've got to provide the funding to be able to uh, accommodate the fact that it's going to take some longer. And by the way, your Asian Studies uh, example, the reason why the provost can do that in Asian Studies is because he or she doesn't have to do it in election or war. Mm -hmm. Or valid uh, association, yeah. So um, uh, maybe just one, Let me one thing here. Yeah, so um, oh, one thing that I always, always uh, treasure, I think uh, Tom, you probably remember, is that um, you know, I want all my students to own their work and own their uh, own thesis and career. And not every student will come in understanding what ownership means. And some of them may take a long, long time to figure out how to own something. Some of them will uh, take much shorter time. So, but I think fundamentally, if a PhD student comes out understanding how to own a topic, how to really work it in a way that, um, you know, it's his or her own baby, and you know, what, then, then everything else really just follows. So, uh, last, uh, well, this past weekend, we had uh, several of our alums uh, come for uh, some event, and uh, we were sort of reminiscing as, you know, how were we able to do this? And I said, you know what? You guys were here. You came to Wisconsin because you got rejected from the better places and had something to prove. Um, and so that was important, that you sort of had that, uh, you know, fire in your belly. But then also, with almost all of them, you know, you never gave them a problem and said to work on this. You could do that. It's sort of like, you know, like, you know, building a building is you could start them from the ground floor and say build a top, or you could let them start and build a foundation on their own. Help along the way, okay? But, you know, when they get to a point, well, let them, you know that this is where they should be, let them get to that point themselves. So then they can go well beyond where you are at too. And so, uh, you know, that's what I would highly, so a few of my students were very, very frustrated. Uh, one especially uh, saying, oh, I didn't get anything done this year. And I said, well, I think you did. Because then they, from that point on, we took on to the next step, which they wouldn't have had. I just said, start off over here. agree with you for the very reason that you're under the gun to get stuff done pr pretty quickly and it's, it's another thing that's wrong and, you know, sort of structurally wrong in the system I guess um, you, you, you've got this guy you want him to start producing they're not you know Well, in the end, you know, the answer is very simple. Do it yourself. Okay? You know, every word that I wrote in a paper as an assistant professor, I did it myself. I even drew the figures. Okay? <laughs> Just like Yale did when he was trying to. I don't draw figures anymore. I don't do anymore. You know, so do it yourself. And this was true the same on paper? That's exactly what you do. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. So.
Okay, if I need a mic, I need a mic. I guess I am getting to be my age or something. <laughs> Uh, didn't Stanford have a thing where you weren't allowed to submit more than three papers to the tenure case or something? At I, some I point? remember that. I know that you're not allowed to say anything about how much research funding you bring in. That's explicitly. But that's good. I like yeah. that. Research funding is input, and you want to measure output. So I, I like that. But the, this Question concept of on, if on it was three papers, paper. you are not allowed to put up more than three papers then I see a lot of this, you know, everybody knows the acronym, right? LPU, you know, least publishable unit, and you see it all over the place. And yeah, they also say that deans can count, but they can't read. <laughs> <laughs> so publish the same paper, just change the title. There you go. The only thing I do is they have this center for writing at Stanford, which I guess all the English graduate students go to work out to get <laughs> some, so some money on the side. And, and it's actually very helpful if their problem is really just sort of understanding, in, you know, style and rules of usage and stuff like that. And I send them there. Um, I've also, on, on various occasions, hired copy editors to, to work with students. Um, but and that, that will help with the mechanics of it. What's much harder, I think, is to get people to organize their thoughts in, into a logical progression of what you want to say. And, and the, the people you can hire can't help with that. You just have to work with the student. And if they're smart, they'll get it. I mean, I, I literally sit with them and go through the whole thing, edit, reorganize, until at some point they can do it themselves, mostly. Yeah, but it's actually the, the probably the most difficult part of graduate uh, education. But um, my experience is that um, if you really want to have someone who comes out as a uh, very good writer, um, it really takes a, a very long cycle for that first paper because uh, they invariably would, would write something about this is what I did, right? And then, uh, you know, after three rejections and then four, uh, you know, what, uh, four revisions, whatever, then they started to say, okay, uh, here are the problems and, you know, th th these are the things that I really did and uh, rather than a whole, you know, just a whole list of things that they did. But that takes a long, long time and if you are in a rush for papers, a lot of times you just have to do it yourself. Yeah, and the, 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 the and now the irony is that this kind of work, you end up writing a lot, right? I spend a lot of time writing reports, papers, stuff for class, and that was the worst subject. Uh, uh, you know, writing was the reason I did, I went into science and math, not because I couldn't stand it, and that's all I do. It's, uh, it's <laughs> so, so uh, like hell, I guess. I can, uh, <laughs> I can, I can relate my experience to my advisor. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, you know, you, you printed stuff out on a spin writer, not fancy laser printers. So it came out in, you know, single column, double spaced. And uh, I'd give it to my advisor, and my advisor would uh, write with a red pen. And uh, you figured out there was more red than black. Uh, and uh, the red was how it should be written. And next time, you may try to make sure there was more black than red. Uh, as simple as that. So. Anyway, a lot of people time for drinks. <laughs> a lot of people in this place are not particularly gifted at expressing themselves in writing. I can't and lucky that I came to the United States because people here are so bad that they do. <laughs> 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 I just send it back. Well, I, 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 uh, everybody agrees that the top four are all of the things we should do. No. Uh, or at least most of the top I, I disagree that, that preparing for a startup is something that should be an objective yep. academic it's research. Right? Well, I are we doing it as good as we can? If not, what is stopping? Well, I think we're not, absolutely. And the whole point of my ignoring the chart is I think people are doing two incremental stuff. They need to take much bigger leaps. And they need to carry the, the you know, a given result much further. Just getting it far enough that you get it published in a conference doesn't mean somebody's going to use it. You need to take ownership of it and say, okay, I'm not done. I don't declare success until I either decide this idea is not good 
it's before it's time or somebody picks it up and uses it. You, you really have to view that getting a, having impact means taking your research result and not just producing it, but marketing it and getting somebody to adopt it. Do you have to actually build it? No, I don't think you do, but I think that's one way of reducing perceived risk for people. But there can be other ways of reducing perceived risk. You just have to, you have to figure out what it's going to take to get them to say, yeah, I agree, that's a good idea. So, you know, I, I disagree with C completely, and I actually think that if, if, you know, I started off by saying there's a lot of stuff being dumped on public universities and, you know, like you should be more startups. And I think if universities want startups, they should have a very simple policy. Uh, it's like the sort of the Stanford policy they have. Stanford has this policy. I don't think it's official, but it's de facto. And uh, the policy is a, a tenured professor at Stanford or MIT their median house price should be, the, the, the house they live in should be the median house price of Stan, uh, Palo Alto or Lexington. So if U, UT had a policy that the uh, uh, UT professor must live in a house for which the median price is the same as Palo Alto or Lexington, <laughs> there will be many startups over here. I guarantee <laughs> you that. Why don't you just simplify it and say you want tenure or, or you want promotion? You so. could, that, that's, the, the, that, that's the driving force behind this whole publishing craze because they, you know, the, the rules are if you want tenure, you've got to publish. So we've got more. One thing is that there's a million conferences, right? There's sort of conferences about conferences. On, and it's, <laughs> it, so that people have got more outlets to publish. So if you want something, you've got, the, you've got a hammer. It's called tenure or promotion. You could get anything you want, basically. If you, you know, I've, I've always thought we, we, we always have, we have this problem in, in engineering that we're sort of gender imbalanced and there, you know, we we don't have any underrepresented minorities and things. It'd be, is it just you want tenure? Graduate, you know, three people in this space instantly. I mean, <laughs> instantly. And seriously. Because this, we applied the same rule. Once upon a time, it wasn't published or heard. That became a metric, and guess what? We, you know, people have got stacks of papers like this. In fact, I saw a statistic the other day that they're only read by, on average, 1.3 people. <laughs> from the, and, and there's more authors than 1.3 people. So you know. How much university research do we need? Do we have too many research universities? Do we not have enough? How much university research do we need? I'll say something very controversial. I think that we, we have more um, people participating in research than we need. And it wasn't always this way. There was a period of time when a lot of what is now perhaps a third tier of research universities were strictly teaching colleges. And for some reason, even though they were doing a great, they had a very important mission, they were doing a great job at it, they had some inferiority complex. And they felt like they had to be another MIT. And, and they started you know, trying to hire people based on their research. Their teaching uh, got less attention. And I think they're doing less of a good job at what they were really good at doing and what was their core mission. And I don't know that they're really adding a whole lot to the research endeavor. I think that it was interesting. When DARPA started funding computer science, they made a very conscious decision um, to fund um, MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, and Carnegie Mellon. And during a period of time, there was just a concentrated effort. And I think actually concentrating the funding on those four places was a positive thing. It wasn't because good ideas didn't happen elsewhere, but it was because you got above a critical mass in one place. And I think getting above the critical mass is more important than spreading you know, the manure evenly. <laughs> why, uh, why are you being controversial, Bill? I mean, that's, well, I you're stating obvious facts. To be a good professor, you shouldn't have to do research at all. What you should do is scholarship. But for some reason, we've gotten the idea that scholarship is measured by research papers rather than deep understanding of the material. And that's what screwed us up. And these have-not universities that want to be, for, you're right, it's an ego thing. Well, uh, I, 
just make them publish like the like at MIT they have to publish, you know. Whereas they would be doing so much better, better teaching, better self worth, et cetera, if they would just concentrate on scholarship and forget about trying to extend the state of the art. I hate to say I agree with you, but uh. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, another fact, a similarity is this whole thing that everybody has to have a four year bachelor's of degree. So we, this is what's fueling the whole education system. Can you speak up? Sorry. I just said that, that the, it, a similar sort of we want to be like them story is everybody has to get a four year degree. We got, what is it, 60% of the people are getting four year degrees? That's ludicrous. That's what, yeah. what, why not? I mean, the problem is we've, we've sort of deprecated, we've deprecated as a society these positions, and guess what? People are not filling them. Yeah, I think that's. Why? I think that's a. close to it, but we're way mm -hmm. over the top with English. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think <laughs> <laughs> okay, actually, so so in the interest of time, in the interest of time, Yale, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? Hold on. Uh, one final question for all of the panelists. Your personal opinion, what's the difference between a professor, teacher, and a researcher? Quick, short answers, please. Yeah, so I, I think a professor is, I, I think Yale said it well, a professor is a scholar, somebody who develops a deep understanding of some, some topic. A teacher, and, and we actually have a lot of teachers at Stanford who aren't professors. We, we hire lecturers to teach the big undergraduate CS courses. They're people whose goal is to stand in front of a classroom and basically, you know, convey, convey knowledge, motivate students to learn. Um, and a researcher need not be a professor. They're somebody who works in a lab and tries to discover what isn't already known. I completely agree. I just add one thing to what Yale said. That whole business of being a scholar, professor, or whatever, it's Professor is a con you, you know three guys, old guys. <laughs> 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 I used to know I used to know three guys. You used to four one. A professor is a combination of researchers and teachers. And um, uh, one thing that uh, I think is important is we need to really understand that. Um, Every professor doesn't have to be an equal combination of researcher and teacher. And I think today's age, we, we did way too much of that. So. Yes, my, my mic broke. I'm sorry, what's the... Uh, what's the difference between a professor, a teacher, and a researcher? That's a good question. I, I, Someone said there's too much research going on at universities, and I, I don't agree with that. I don't think all research has to be useful in what it produces. I, I think certainly at the school level, the purpose of research is to teach, to learn a certain way of thinking. And unless you do the research, you don't think that way. Also, uh, a comment on school, that now what, 60% of the population goes to college? I, if, if you go into a typical high school, I'm sorry, most kids are not ready to do that, and, and I think you can make a very good living doing 
many trades that few people go into anymore. Maybe that's where you can make a good living doing that. Well, I, I agree with, I mean, they all answered your question, but since I have the last word, I do want to make a comment. If most of the panel and Yale came around to my answer, which was A. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, let's stand up. Okay, okay, we're done with the panel. Urban, do you want to talk, is there an adjournment? Okay. Take so let yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate y'all coming. I hope to see you. Thank you.